Thank you for tuning in to the one and only Georgina Stripping the Dipping. You're joined by your usual co-host, Denzel Clarkson, a.k.a. Chocolate Superman. Do you wish to be entertained? Do you wish to be enlightened? Do you wish to be infused with all things and everything F1 business, culture, and lifestyle? Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our show, Vincenzo Landino! Vincenzo, sir, how is it going? I, I wanted to just I wanted to yell out like, "Are you not entertained?" Really <laughs> I wanted to do that too. Oh, that was fantastic! <laughs> oh, Great thank intro. You, man. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> Honestly, I, I love it. And um, thank you as well for joining us today on the on the platform today as well, Vincenzo. Could you uh just tell us how you're doing and also give our listeners at home a synopsis of what you do in relation to our beautiful F1 world? Yeah, doing doing fantastic here. I'm in sunny South Florida at the moment. Um, just a few weeks away from the Miami GP, and Ooh. excited. Won't will not be going. I uh, have a newborn. She's nine days old as of to yesterday. Today, she's I don't know. She's she's young, Aww. so I, I'm not. I won't be attending the Miami GP, but that's okay. Um, I have. I actually. I own a production company. We do uh, media and content creation for enterprise tech companies and f1's always been a passion of mine i've been watching f1 since i was a a a young kid and i decided maybe a couple years back that i would talk more about formula one especially online you know with with um this is you know really before the, the massive popularity of it but that kind of paid off because of all the popularity and now you're now it's like if you're talking about F1, you are uh, you are one of many. But I, I think the the people that are doing good work, like yourselves, are, are standing out, and they're able to differentiate, um, you know, uh, the the good content from just kind of like everything else out there, the noise. Me personally, in Formula One, I have a newsletter. It's called the Qualifier, and I focus on F1, kind of the the business and media side of the of the of Formula One. So a lot of uh, TV data, social media numbers, like how using social media, how TV is helping really grow the sport a little bit more. And I focus a little bit on that. Some of the lifestyle and culture stuff um, as well. Been been really trying to work down that road. But really, yeah, just an independent kind of an independent uh, pundit, so to speak. And uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm doing in F1 is pretty much that. And I, I use my Twitter like like a sword. <laughs> well, I think you touched on some really great things there, Vincenzo. And absolutely, with F1, it's become an ever-growing sport. We've seen from year in, year out, that it's continued to grow in numbers and its appeal across the world, of course. And just another massive shout-out to you as well in relation to the work that you're doing with that, with the newsletter. You're super active with it. I was just about trying to get into the newest uh, edition that you added in relation to the Miami protest or uh, lawsuit, which we'll probably touch on a bit later on in the show. But again, <laughs> yeah. this super important impressive work and I'm sure most of our listeners would have already known you by now but of course there's always some new people that are trying to like get into the sport and I think that you would be a great like safe haven for them in terms of content and you know giving them some footing and standing to understand all the elements and aspects of the sport as well which is great yeah thank you so um that kind of leads us into the first question in in more of the, the business side of Formula One we know that money makes the world go round, and F one's an example of that. And we know that all the teams, in a way, have to try and make money to try and uh, sustain their longevity in the sport. But how is it that teams actually earn their revenue when it comes to you know some of the costs and expenses that they have? And also, how does Liberty Media and also FOM like earn money through the teams or tracks and sales of merchandise and stuff like that too? Yeah, I mean the teams. The teams is fairly simple. You know you. I mean, it's it's all fairly simple if we keep it at high level. Um, the teams, you are more successful. The the success breeds you know more money really. So the reason why you have teams like a Mercedes that's loaded with great sponsors is because they've had a lot of success. Um, sponsors want to be associated with winning teams, winning brands. There's a reason why Williams has a hard time finding sponsors. Haas has a hard time finding sponsors. I'm not saying there's nobody that won't sponsor that will sponsor them. Um, Williams had Duracell. That was great, but there's not much more on the Williams car um, or associated with the Williams brand. You have Lavazza coffee. I think they have a Cronus. Um, 
I'm trying to think of the others right off the top of my head. I don't have it in front of me, but they, they don't have a ton. Right. And that's mm-hmm. it. I don't want to say it's by design because it's not, but that's the, what's the word I'm looking for. Um, that's kind of the luck of the draw. You perform poorly on the track and you get less money from sponsorship revenue. Um, you know, Ferrari had a great, you know, Mission Winnow, they want to jump back in now. And they, they made a deal to jump back in with, with, with Scuderia. And very likely because they just want to be associated with winning. Um, so that, that's, you know, sponsorship is one of the biggest plays. And then you have your, your, your payouts, you know, your, your uh, winning, your, your constructor championships, uh, your constructor positions you know, first place, second place, third place. So the, every, every place is millions and millions of dollars. You know, the difference between, um, I'm, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to probably not have the exact number in front of me, but the difference between, you know, being able to like, like last year, actually perfect example, the money that was made between uh, third in the constructors versus fourth in the constructors, you know, Ferrari versus McLaren, that was a big battle because there's tens of millions of dollars at stake between that one single position and tens of millions of dollars, you know, can mean so much in terms of, you know, development in terms of, you know, what you can actually do, you know, now, now of course there's, there's the cap, there's $175 million cap or so. Um, But still you want to have, more money to be able to do certain things. And so that's how the teams go. And I think your second question was really about formula one and, 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 and uh, Liberty media, which I think is even easier or it's, it's straightforward. Let's put it that way. It's, it's straightforward. You've got money from broadcasting TV, commercial rights, that kind of thing. You've got advertising or, or sponsors, uh, partners, you've got race promotion fees or hosting fees, um, and then they make their own investments or merchandising and all that kind of stuff. So globally, you're looking at telev- television contracts upwards of $600 million. And that's right now. That is not what it will be. Because as these rights deals start to expire, they're going to get bigger. So, for example, in the United States, the deal that ESPN has for broadcasting – Formula One is somewhere to the tune of about $5 million a year, which is absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. The Formula One, Liberty Media has said, uh, the CEO of Liberty Media, Greg Maffei, has he's actually said that when this new deal comes up, they will be looking at somewhere in the range of $75 million or more a year. So big difference between $5 million, what ESPN is paying, versus 75 million dollars uh and and that's going to happen all across the globe as the sport gains popularity as as it becomes um this global phenomenon the rights deals are going to be massive there has been talk of getting these deep broadcast deals into the range of what um football soccer calcio whatever you want to call it whatever into that range of deals, which are massive hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars contracts. So formula one is on track or on pay. Like that's where they want to go with it. Um, the, you know, then you have things like race sanctioning fees. I, the number that I have in my head from or the most recent number that I think is available was somewhere around 650 million or 655 million, I believe, for sanctioning fees from, you know, tracks. Um, and the average number was somewhere around 30 to 31 million per track that pays just to host a GP or track. I say, you know, the group that is purchasing for, you know, to have a, a race. So 30, so you're thinking, you know, think about 30 million. So each race, each new race, you know, we, we hear, oh, Formula One, they want to add 30, you know, up to 30 races. Of course they do. It's $30 million a pop. Imagine if they can make a billion dollars just from race sanctioning revenue. Like, that's that's the trajectory of that. Um, Monaco pays less. I, if Monaco pays at all, I, I, I'm not even 100% sure on Monaco. There, sometimes they, I've heard they don't pay. 
Others say that they pay very little. Uh, I, I don't actually know. The, the deal there, again, if the sport continues to grow in popularity – you have a, a position where F1 now can command a much higher sanctioning fee. So let's just say it was $30 million in, in 2016 or 2017. You know, you could be at a point where those sanctioning fees are $50 million, which would also take away from other, you know, potential locations like, um, you know, areas that don't have as much money. You know, that's why you're seeing a race in Miami. But are we realistic in Kailami? if they don't have the money, Germany, we want to go back to Germany and, you know, the fans want to go back to Hockenheim, but it doesn't seem like there's money to be able to host that GP again. So, you know, there's so many things to think about when it comes to, to that. Um, And then you have ticket sales, which is pretty straightforward. They get a portion of the ticket sales goes back to formula one and sponsorships. So sponsorships, all the major partners you see, like the big partnership that just um, happened at the Australian Grand Prix with Salesforce uh, was roughly a 30 ish million dollar a year deal from what I was hearing rumblings. And that's, that's just so that Salesforce can put their banner all over the place. There was brands like zoom um, Amazon web services, all of the, you know, like you, you'll see those all over Um, Pirelli Rolex, uh, Heineken, all of those brands you see all over, blasted all over a track and all over your, your, uh, you know, your, your, your broadcast, those brands are paying a lot of money to be involved with Formula One or, or they're providing something in like in Pirelli's um, case, you know, they're, they're a provider of something. But most of those brands are paying large fees just to be involved with Formula One. And that's that's basically that's the long and short of it. Let's let's we'll stick to that for the for the, the short of it. I'd say follow me for more. <laughs> sure. Well, we'll be plugging you anyway on that one, Vincenzo. But yeah, I think that was a really great and sterling answer. You really touched on pretty much every single loophole or every single kind of door set and facet of how the teams make their money and then also vice versa, how the FIA and obviously Liberty Media do it as well. And really some great points there as well. You mentioned about like Formula One teams trying to be as, as successful as they can because viewers will also know with me that like for a period of time, I was doing some work experience just in a Mercedes-Benz dealership and the biggest uh, sales play that the the head salesperson would say is if we win on a Sunday we're going to sell on a Monday and that was always the kind of key so it's nice to see that that still yep. is very translucent today and also as well you've touched on a lot of great points there in relation to the commercialization of Formula 1 how that's continued to develop and grow as it, it touches new emerging markets and it continues to probably upgrade itself in the existing one so really cool too and I think that's really a good segue into the next question can i can i jump into something you just said real quick if you don't sure sure so you made a really good point working you know working in a uh, a mercedes dealership the brands like a ferrari a mercedes uh, maybe not so much nasa martin because even with ferrari you know ferrari is they have so much history there's they're gonna sell their cars no matter what but how much better does it look when they win on sunday and the car goes, you know, it's it, it's synonymous with speed. It was something that Henry Ford um, wanted when he, you know, in the epic 1960, you know, that whole situation. The reason for that was because they wanted to appear fa- fast. Now, sure. j- just because there's a fast car on the track doesn't mean you can buy that fast car, right? A, a GT40 you're not, you can't buy it, right? Or you could, but I mean, if they're expensive. I probably have to remortgage whatever. like five houses, but yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. But the, the point is that now the, the, the mark, the brand, the logo becomes synonymous with speed, mm-hmm. with, uh, uh, you know, whatever else is associated with, with winning in Formula One. So speed being the, the ideal one. That, that, that's, that is invaluable. If you've noticed... I'm going to take AMG, for example. I, so personally, I drive it. I have an AMG. But it, if you look at how Mercedes has positioned the AMG branding, AMG has become this badge of 
quality, this badge of speed, this badge of, you know, power, motorsport. They've been that that mark is becoming so much more popular. I have never seen so many AMGs on the road now. And I like, you know, from before this, you know, people would have would drive a Mercedes. Well, now people are now it's like it's not good enough to just have a Mercedes. You need to have an AMG. Right. Exactly. And so you can't tell me that that doesn't have to do with how they position it, whether it's in the showroom or or on the on TV but it's because of what's going like even if you don't watch formula 1 you're affected by it by the way these brands are now marketing to you with you know I'm again I'm using AMG because I I do have one so like I I'm 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 in the dealership I'm in the the you know the shop or whatever so like <laughs> I know I I remember they had a Nico Rosberg poster in the shop in where I had bought my mine and uh you know they had all the motorsport that they were involved with in the showroom. And I'm like, most people don't care about this, but you know what? For the people that did, it was like, Oh, look at that. Nico Rosberg is on the wall. Like it, you know what I mean? And so sure. it, it's that positioning is, is increasing and it's all because of the success on the track. Definitely. I agree with you. I definitely think there is a correlation between obviously the performance you have on the track and then making that wider appeal as well in terms of the product that you sell just to the normal consumers, you know, like us, Mm -hmm. the people on our side. So absolutely. I agree with you on that 110%. And kind of bringing it to our next question, like um, it's quite interesting as well, Vincenzo, because during the kind of winter break, me and you were on a lot of like uh, F1 Twitter spaces and there was a big thing about like, you know, it's great what Liberty Media are doing. They're bringing the sport basically to a new plethora of people that maybe never had access to it or really checked to it before. But there's always been this argument or debate as to entertainment versus the sporting integrity. And sure. my question to you as well, Vincenzo, was um, how do you see platforms like Drive to Survive uh, for right now? And do you think that they'll be sustainable in the future? Interesting question. Um, hmm. I uh that's a oh that's a really good question. So I think yes, are they sustainable? You yes. Yes and no. Mm-hmm. Yes because they just simply have to keep shooting or creating content. No because you have to continually uh one up yourself with content. So uh creators, any creator like a YouTube creator goes through the same I'm gonna, and I'm going to liken this to a YouTube creator because you know, there's probably a, someone on YouTube that we all follow that we love. And when they do something outrageous, the next video has to be more outrageous in order for them to continue building upon the audience they've built. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. Sure, Drive to Survive course. only has to get more outrageous in its current, in, in the current format. It has to get more outrageous in order for people to continue being enticed by it, which is where, of course, things like Abu Dhabi of last year rub people the wrong way because it seems as if the drama was manufactured because that's the only way you can keep people continually involved. So is it sustainable is a, is a good question. But I think it's a question that needs more nuance because you may be able to continue producing it the way it is. But if you continue down this trajectory of drama, then you only have to get more dramatic in order to. This is why uh, reality TV shows like, um, you know, Real Housewives or whatever those shows are, um, they get more dramatic and more uh, shocking every time every season they have to because if you only stay as dramatic as the last season well it's going to get old and so the same thing with, with drive to survive it's no different where you are are actually having to find a way to make things dramatic chop up lines um from different races and make them seem like they were set at certain times but we're talking about a real sport that has other implications uh, that let's take gambling implications. For example, if there's, if you know, people are betting on sports, betting is a massive business. 
Well, if you are now manufacturing drama, uh, you're also now affecting normal people's livelihoods, right? Like that's, that's a potential, but also just fans of the sport. Well, you know, (laughs) if you're manufacturing a race, like many people believe happened at, at the end of the year last year, I, I am one of those that believes it was um, – I don't believe it was necessarily manufactured, but I believe it was false. It was not done correctly. And that's because there's pressures that build up because of something like a drive to survive where it's like, well, how do we keep this fresh and interesting? The, the season – let's take last year. The season didn't need any additional drama from drive to survive. It had plenty of drama on its own. So – they didn't, you know, they, Netflix, whoever, didn't need anything to happen other than what was going to happen. It was happenstance that we got what we got. But those are those are things that I think Formula One needs to step back and think, how do we want this sport to grow? Do we want this to grow because people love this sport? Do we want this to grow because of the racing on the track? Or do we want this to grow just to become like wrestling, you know, WWE wrestling where sure. it's like, we know it's fake, but it just keeps, keeps growing or it keeps, you know, doing well because it's, it's, it's wrestling. It's entertaining. It's acting. Like that's something that I think Liberty needs to figure out. And soon, because that's really the, and, and I know I'm being very extreme with this. So people that are listening to this and are going to say, Oh, that's, it's not WWE. I know it's not, but it could very quickly get to that level or perceived as that because sure. of how they want to, you know, promote things like, like drive to survive. So that's why I'd say, yes, it's sustainable and no, it's not sustainable because there's so many things to look at when you, you know, when you see a production like that and how it's become so ingrained into the culture of formula one at this point, you know, drive to survive is synonymous with formula one Too many people, not, not everybody, not f- people that have been fans of the sport for a long time or people that have never watched it, but for the folks that are you know, new to the sport and to the sponsors that are new to the sport, Drive to Survive is pretty synonymous with Formula One. Mm-hmm. So now it becomes a conversation where it's like we need to really look, back, look into ourselves and say, what exactly are we doing with, you know, with this? So I... I I think they will. I think they, there's already con, you know talks that Liberty or, or um, you know Formula One is going to talk to the drivers and kind of have a sit down with drivers and Netflix and really figure out the drama portion. But it, again, pressures and money make make uh, make make decisions very difficult. Of course, and I think you, you hit a nail on there, definitely, in terms of just in terms of the different pressures that the, are in there, and of course how the sponsors will also deem some of the decisions. And you rightfully pointed out as well that even just like external companies, like the betting companies that you know make their kind of living on the sport, can also be hampered when we we start crossing this line between entertainment and also sports as well, and trying to find that balance, you know, to keep the longevity of the sport the series and just to see what kind of legacy this sport will have in the future. So some good points there. And then on the topic of legacy, I know that you're a Ferrari man. I know you've got those Italian connections, but um, another question that we've had in from a viewer was how does the legacy bonus work with Ferrari and how important is Ferrari to the identity of F1? (sighs) Well, you're asking, you're asking a fan of Ferrari. So it's, (laughs) <laughs> the second part of your question, how important is are they to F1? I think – so I will answer this question in a non-Tifoso way. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will say this. I think they are I, – I, I think they are important to Formula One uh, because of how synonymous they've become with the sport um, a lot. And, and also because there is – it, they don't produce a car that you can buy anywhere, right? Or that anybody can just go and buy. True. It, it, they're, they're known for something. They're known for, for I don't want to say for one thing, but they're known for racing. They're known for speed. They're known for this passion. 
Um, and they've been around for a long time. They've been in the sport ever since its inception. I think that that is important for the historical aspect of the sport and legacy of the sport. Uh, fans of the sport that are around that have been, you know, that are older fans, that that means a lot to them. To, and everyone has said this, not everyone, but a lot of people have said this. The sport is better when Ferrari is winning or when they're doing well. And, and, and obviously from my perspective, I love, I love that. I want that, but it, it, it's true. It, and the same goes for teams like McLaren and Williams. If, if they're all doing well from a historical aspect, it, it's better for the sport. It's better for everybody. Um, but on the topic of Ferrari, the payment that they get, um, I think it's something like $35 million just for being there, you know, just to show up every year and, and bring to the sport. Are they worth $35 million to the, to the um, sport? I, I think so, right now at least. Um, the other things that, that – Aside from money, though, that Ferrari get, which I think are are important for Ferrari, but not necessarily for the sport, is um, they have a veto right, which they protect at all costs. So they they have essentially almost a greater say than anybody on on things because they can veto particular, um, whatever you know, right, decisions, regulations like or whatnot, that. decisions yeah. that that come into play. Um, so yeah, there, there's, there's a, the discussion I think with them is that how much longer do they become or do they remain relevant? But here's what I'll, I'm going to flip this one on its head and say, every time a rapper, a, uh, TV star, a, uh, whatever TV show, whatever shows, a Ferrari, that to me proves the, their, how valuable they are, right? They're not driving around in, um, you know, yes, Mercedes maybe, but like they're not driving around in a Mercedes. You're not driving around in a Red Bull car. Um, McLarens are pretty, you know, are, are pretty popular, but every time you hear that, that word Ferrari in a, or Rari or whatever they say mm-hmm. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a rap song, you are reminded as to why they become synonymous with, you know, luxury, with the Formula One culture, with with speed, with racing. Be, you know, when you hear things like that, most most people on the street, if you walked up to them and said, "Hey, name me a fast," you know, name a fast car, name a fast car brand, they'd probably say, they would probably say Ferrari. I w- I would think first. I, I I know most people I talk to, like they know Ferrari, they don't know anybody else, right? They don't know Aston Martin. They don't know, they don't know um, Williams Racing. They don't know Haas. They don't know um, uh, Alfa Romeo. Alfa Romeo and Ferrari, very close histories there, but they don't know Alfa Romeo. Now, again, I'm talking about uh, maybe an American consumer, but you know, e- e- anywhere around the world, there's massive, massive con- in the Middle East. I don't know how much you guys, you know, kind of follow uh, folks in the Middle East, like on social media. It's like they're some of the biggest collectors of Ferraris in the world. Asian culture, massive. There's tons of Ferrari uh, collectors and and fans. Like it's a global, global um, fandom. And it's not even just a fandom. I mean, these are people that traditionally Formula One has wanted around their sport, you know, very rich people that have the means to go to races that have the ability to spend money on things, potentially sponsor. So like, I I just think when you look at all of that, that Adi becomes pretty monumental and pretty pivotal to what formula one is trying to achieve now going forward. If they're trying to change that perspective of what, Formula One culture and lifestyle is that it's not only this exclusive elite club, then that could change. But I think as of right now, that's it's that's not a team that you want out of the sport. I think sure. it would instantly devalue a lot of what you know, if, if, if Ferrari and listen, Ferrari, oh, they are you know, they're the number one uh, culprits when it comes to threatening to leave the sport, they know their <laughs> position within the sport, sure. Um, you know, I, I hated last year how people said, 
oh well mercedes is they're they're, they're cry babies they're they're threatening to leave the sport or Red Bull is threatening to leave the sport, you know, at, at other points. No, they all have threatened to leave the sport. Let's be real here. There's only three teams that if they threaten to leave the sport currently, um, that it would matter. And I would even argue that there's only two that really matter. I, I would say that Red Bull, they could, people could get by without Red Bull. Um, you know, so like, again, that's where we're at right now. I think, I think they are worth their $35 million uh, uh, payment. But I think that can change at some point. And I think it, I think it eventually will just because of where the sport is going. Sure. And, you know, I mean, it does make sense, I guess, because like you said as well, like there's a particular direction the sport is moving in. But at the same time, I think as you rightly pointed out as well, there is a lot of historical legacy that needs to be maintained. People need to remember the Ferrari were one of the original teams in the original Formula One series. And like you mm-hmm. said, it's just the wide star strucking like appeal. Like, anytime you see a Ferrari on the street, mm-hmm. people immediately turn their heads and they're starstruck. And it's just it's the magic really behind the brand and just keeping on the topic of ferrari uh vincenzo yeah. what have you made about like the impressive stuff <laughs> and what do you think has given them the upper hand so far well the fact that they weren't really in that race last year i think that i think that that two horse race last year between mercedes and red bull took a lot out of those two teams you know most fans that have been around the sport for a while you know, we, I don't want to say we knew, but mm-hmm. we understood that it was going to be, especially with new regulations and testing um, uh, times and, and whatnot, that Mercedes and Red Bull would be behind slightly. I don't think anyone expected Mercedes to be as far behind as they started. Um, I, I've been on record. There's tweets. There's probably interviews with whatever videos I've made. I don't believe that Mercedes will be trailing for too long i think that they've got massive resources available to them more so than other teams in terms of just man you know a uh, human power mm-hmm. um at the factory that and they've got brilliant minds that they will you know be able to figure it out and turn it around so i think that you know that's why the lead looks so great is because right now there's no it's first of all we've had three races and Leclerc's won two. He's come in second in another. Signs has finished on the podium twice, and obviously he he DNF'd. But uh, did Signs finish on the podium twice? Now I said that, and now I'm like, oh wait, did Signs? Yeah, he podium twice, right? Um. So, I yes, I, I listen. I I think it's a great start. It's a it's a unexpected. I would say it's unexpected to an extent, but also not super surprising. Only because when you look at the time that they had. And if, you know, last towards the end of last year, it was like, we're not focusing on, I mean, there were so many times last year where Binotto didn't even show up to races because they were focused on building, you know, this, this car, like this is what the focus was for so long. Um, And I think that's, that's critical to understand in, you know, if you're a new fan that just gets dropped into, Oh, wow. Look, Ferrari's at the top. Yeah, that's yes, they are. Um, But, They've been working at the car. They've been, uh, you know, trying things for longer than than some of the other teams have. Um, so that's that's to no that's to no surprise. But then you have things like the you know the power unit, which has shown shown tremendous potential. They've they've said over and over that they have not yet turned it up. They are they are uh, focusing on reliability. A lot of just the way. And, and the, the comments that you're hearing out of Modinello these days are just very different. They feel very different. Um, what, you know, what Binotto is saying and, and some of the, some of the, the comments he's made about the team and focusing on we, and obviously Leclerc is the number one guy there. I think that's, that's uh, I, I think Ferrari has to make that clear at some point. They probably haven't made that clear yet to, to the drivers. Um, but based on performance, I think they know. And, uh, I, you know, that, that to me signals a, a change of mindset and, a, and a, a positive change. You know, maybe they are now focusing on let's worry about getting the, the, the brand back to glory, not just one driver similar to what a Red Bull is doing, you know, where it's like they only care about Max. It's Max for Max and we don't <laughs> care about anybody else. Right. Sure. Um, you, it doesn't matter who's that second driver is. 
it's it's all about Max. With Ferrari, you don't seem to get that vibe right now. You seem to get a vibe where it's like it's all for one, or it's not all for one. It's all for the team, and that's all they care about. So, uh, is it sustainable uh, through the season? I think their performance will continue, but I think other teams will start to catch up faster. As you know, we're going to see probably some upgrades coming next week at Imola from a lot of the teams. Uh, they're suspect that uh, Federati is bringing some more upgrades, I think, to Spain. So, like, now we're going to start seeing, okay, what have you guys been working on? What has everybody been working on? I think Federati's got it. I think they, they, they are doing a good job back at the factory in really understanding the regulations. I hope the rumors aren't true about um, them getting a leg up with F1 on the fuel. Like that was that was one of the rumors going around that they had gotten some extra help on the fuel uh, regulations, which it, it, some of the teams are claiming they're struggling with or whatnot. Uh, but yeah, it's exciting. I mean, this this is, I mean, for me, this is the most excited I've been in in a God, a long time for for two drivers and the team itself. But they're actually putting it together on the track. I mean, last week's performance for. Leclerc was flawless. I mean, dominant, dominant, flawless, just didn't put a foot wrong. And they were dealing with, you know, porpoising it, which what I found really interesting about the the drive in Australia was that they were dealing with the porpoising issues almost. It felt it seemed like worse than some of the other teams, but the car was still able to handle the track. You know, it's still stuck like glue. So, they almost said, you know what, whatever, we'll, we'll deal with the porpoising. Let's just, our car is clearly better in, in the corners, and it's, and it's just as fast as the Red Bulls. They, they know the reliability is far greater than some of these other cars, and that's where I think it's, it's a slow, steady race across. It's 23 races. You know, if, if they stay reliable, which there's no indication that they won't, that's where I think they win, not because of pure pace, which I think the Red Bull has, or aerodynamics, which I think you know the Mercedes probably has in spades. At some, you know, they'll get there, but I think it's just slow and steady. We do, we do it well. We're going to unleash the, the engine little by little, not all at once, and and that's how they. And and this is what excites me is like this slow, steady pace. We're not going to just let it all go in one shot. And then the engine blows up, and now we're burning through engines like Alpine is, you know, with those Renaults. They, I think, I, I think Alonso's gone through three um, ices already. Yep. You know, this season, which is ridiculous, right? It's a new one every race. Like that's that's insane. Um, so th- there, there's a lot of excitement right now for for Ferrari, and I, I'm I'm one of those super excited people. Oh, well, I don't blame you, Vincenzo. And, you know, likewise for me too, because I grew up kind of in the early Michael Schumacher era and just seeing that red car on TV, I just knew that something was, was special. And, you know, to see this resurgence, just to see how happy everyone is, to hear yeah. that Italian national anthem and then even yeah. the Monegasque, like, national anthem is very jolly and upbeat. You know, yeah. you, you can't fathom that, uh, fathom them for that. It's, it's so lovely to see. And I'm um, really kind is. of exactly you know and also kind of to circle on the point that we brought on earlier but just to kind of dig into it a bit deeper we were talking about like sponsors and just like how yeah. teams use that to, to make money but Vincenzo like how do you think sponsors affect the team throughout a season and we know that cash is king but sometimes is it the case that like a sponsor can have an adverse effect on a team such as you know Mercedes with the Kingspan deal last year or Aramco with Aston Martin or even the very comical Haas with Rich Energy as we all uh, yeah. know and love. Yeah, um, I, I think you do have, you know, sponsors can affect, depending on how much a team affords a sponsor um, uh, a, a say, mm-hmm. right? So in a let's take a case like Haas and the Earl Kali situation, which I think Drive to Survive did a really good job showing how difficult it was for Gunther Steiner to deal with the Earl Kali and the Mazepins. Um, I don't think it, many people realize how difficult that was for Gunther. Cause it's easy to say from a fan perspective, Oh, well, come on, just get rid of them or just do this or just do that. 
But, you know, then you realize what Gunther's dealing with and it's, you know, hey, here's the source of income for your team to operate. And he's saying switch chassis for the drivers or he's saying, you know, well, my son's not getting a fair, uh, you know, he's not getting as much engineering as, as the other, you know, as Schumacher. Well, so, yeah, sponsors could have a very uh, adverse effect on on a team if they allow them to or if, again, you're not successful like a hot, you know, you're not successful. You rely on one or two big sponsors to bring in the money and then they're going to have their say, well, okay, well now this is, you'll never get successful that way. Right. You're never going to go from a hot, from, from Haas to a Mercedes by allowing your sponsors to dictate what you do. Now kind of the other, I think side of your question, meaning uh, reputation of course, of course, reputation is a big factor. And I'll say this, it's a money business running these teams, any sport, but you know, in formula one specifically running these teams is cash intensive. It takes a lot of money to make these things happen. (laughs) Turning down a sponsor, let's just say a crypto sponsor, because of some potential, you know, maybe some red flags. I don't know, whatever it might be. Environmental, it uses so much power to mine, bit, you know, mine a Bitcoin, whatever. That's, I, you know, those are some of the, the common things you hear from people. Well, okay, so like you could be leaving a lot of money on the table and that money could help you develop a better car, which would give you more success, which makes you more appealing to a sponsor the next time you need a sponsor. And it's just a continuing cycle. So it's at some point, I think you have to choose and decide at kind of what level of like, what level are you willing to, um, I don't want to say ruin your, but how, how far are you willing to go to bat for some of these sponsors? How far are you willing to defend your sponsorships? And obviously there's a certain level where you're going to, you, you'll defend them. And we saw that with Mercedes and the Kingspan. Uh, last was it last year where they eventually you know they they cut off ties with them because there was too much public outcry. Even though I don't believe, nece- you know, that Mercedes was was doing anything malicious, mm-hmm. but there was just too much public outcry that they you know it's you they had to cut it off right. So reputation sure. in that case mattered. But now if that now I pose this question to you: if that Kingspan deal was a you know uh 500 million dollar over five years like oracle and red bull uh would they have cut them loose Mm, probably not you know what i mean so like sure there's there's a level at which you have to say we are willing to turn the other you know turn away i I don't think it's right don't get me wrong like i'm not saying it's right but i'm just from a (laughs) from a strictly factual standpoint you're running a business. It's a business. Sure. You need sponsors to keep your car competitive. And, and at the end of the day, without those sponsors and without the, the, the funding to keep your team running, listen, Mercedes has got a thousand people back at the factory. Well, how do you pay those people? <laughs> how do you keep That's them true. employed? That's so true. You know? Yeah. So, th- so there's so many things that, you know, when people call for, oh, well, that, that sponsor is no good. You know, that's, this is, this is a, a, a poor choice of a sponsor. Sure. But remember, if you cut that sponsor, you might also be cutting a hundred jobs back at the factory of innocent people who did nothing wrong, you know, who are just working. So like, there's so many sides to the coin, I think that need to be observed when you're looking at that, because the teams are just doing in the moment what they think is right. And how they think they can bring success, um, but but again, there are things that are bigger than sport. There are things that are bigger than than, than dollars. Uh, I don't know if this. I don't know if we've matured to that. Like we thought that Ferrari was over the whole Mission Wino Marlboro connection, and yet they welcomed them back. You know, for for a sponsorship again. We don't know to. We actually don't even know to what extent that partnership is back because we didn't see them on the car in Australia. So I wonder what way they're back. But again, it, it's, it's money. These teams need money to, to survive and to continue. So <laughs> 
are you going to turn down opportunities when someone else would gladly take that money? Another team will gladly take that money. Sure. I don't know. I don't know. No, it's a really great talking points there. And like you said as well, and I, I want to even, this... I, yeah, Go on. no, no, I, I just, I want to make it clear. I, cause I, I'm thinking of what I just said. I, I don't believe it's right. I just sure. think it's the way things work. It's, it's the reality. I agree with you as well, Vincent. Yeah. Listen, you don't, you don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to like um, caveat yourself to these people, man. Like they should be intelligent enough <laughs> to know kind of the point that you're making. I don't think anything you said out there was uh, was unreasonable. It, it makes sense, you know, and it's just at the end of the day, yeah. it's a business. <clears throat> Whilst we're all here to try and do good things for the world and society. And like, I guess we're in a, in a, in a tricky position of like doing the right things morally and also not contradicting ourselves, but at the same time making it sustainable so that it can Correct. continue to run. You know, yeah, there, there are going to be things where, t- like, you know, things are questioned. And of course, as well, I think the beauty of where we are with social media as well these days is that if mm-hmm. there is something that the exactly. fans agree with, they have the power to then, you know, make exactly. the voice heard and, you know, to have things maybe changed, as we saw with the Kingspan situation. So I yeah. absolutely agree with you on that one as well. And um, kind of brings us on to a, a question we've actually got from a, a Twitter user. They've essentially asked us um where does the separation between teams and drivers having sponsorships or partnerships lie so they've used the example of vicenza and they were saying well alfatari have their own clothing line and apparel which is like almost like a nod almost to a benetton like back in the the 90s mm-hmm. and early 2000s with the clothing and so forth but then yep. they compare that with lando norris i think during the uh, the pandemic he wanted to like have his own kind of cool uh, quadrant merch with this very mm-hmm. cool lime green in color and whatnot but mclaren was like hell no you're not putting that on the car we're not putting that on the website sure. and uh, we're asking you to take that down because that's against our own marketing direction like yeah where where is really the the balance i guess between those things well i think i mean alpha tower itself is just that's the team right so it's it's kind of it's a little bit different than say sure. lando having his own brand because then if lando has his own brand well then we have to put uh, Daniel's brand on the thing. Uh, if Daniel has a brand that he wants to support, you got to remember too, these, these uh, drivers have a lot of opportunities for sponsorship. So you could, you could realistically someone like Orlando who's doing a very good job of creating his own brand outside of formula one and driving. Um, it, same thing with Lewis, right? Lewis has a, a tremendous marketing without even trying like he doesn't even have to try uh and lando's doing a great job of of actively trying and actively doing things it's different from the team's directive because number one you all right think think of it this way um and i'm gonna go back to being like a youtuber because i think this is a lot of people can kind of understand the creator mindset or like an influencer mindset imagine being an influencer and um a brand a company offers you $5,000 to do a post and you do it. But then imagine another company coming to you and saying, Hey, we want to post, but we're going to give you a free, a free trip to wherever. Let's see something that's worth $5,000. I don't know. A free trip to Italy. Oh, okay. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do it for free. Well, now you've just diluted the, your 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 brand and you've also diluted the value of a partnership with you because now the next time a brand approaches you and they're going to say well i'm not paying you five thousand dollars anymore because you're willing to stick anybody on your you know you're willing to associate with any brand that gives you something right that's throwing something at you well you know what i'm like i'll give you two thousand dollars and i'll give you a um I don't know, a plane ticket. Okay, what's a plane ticket cost? Let's say $500 US dollars. Okay, so now you've just devalued a, that sponsorship by half just because you're doing things for, for free. So I, I think it's very similar with teams and drivers. And I don't know if I'm answering this person's questions exactly. I'm, I'm answering it the way I think it, in my head it makes sense. Yeah. And so it, it would devalue what a team is trying to do and the price that a team is willing to pull from, you know, for, for, for sponsorship. Also the drivers are getting paid. So the drivers aren't doing this for free. Um, so if you're making, 
let's say $15 million a year to drive the car, you're getting a payment from the team to do that. You are an employee essentially. Now that's, I'm breaking, that's very, very, very simple terms, but you're our employee. Uh, I wouldn't expect the company I worked for to necessarily say, oh, if you bring in, you know, if, if you have your own sponsor, we're going to, we'll, we'll slap that on our website, right? Or somebody you've worked with, we're going to slap that on our website. Like it, that doesn't make sense. You know I mean? I'm just an, I'm an employee. Um, so I think there is a line there between what the drivers have in terms of personal like choices that they, they choose to make, personal connections, personal partnerships that they make. I, I think the beauty of it too is the fact that they can make those personal partnerships. And the, the nice thing is that they are allowed to an extent to show those off maybe on a helmet or, or on their own social media, but it doesn't get conflated with the team's direction. Sure. Right. So they're allowed to operate separately. If that kind of answers the question. No, I think, I it, I I think it definitely does, Vincenzo. Because, like, I think a good example to caveat what you said there as well is, like, maybe Aston Martin and the fact that, you know, they're very, you could say, conservative brand. And, you know, there's a very kind of um, niche clientele and market they have. Mm-hmm. But then on the flip side, you've got Sebastian Vettel, which is, you know, known for being quite a, a humanitarian. He's got, sure. like, a, you know, like a unique helmet with uh, the Ukraine kind of messaging as well with what's going on in the world and like Elton John lyrics or John Lennon lyrics on the yeah, side of yeah. his helmet too. And like you said, it's that like balance, I guess, of you still want to stay true to your roots and obviously your um, your clientele and you don't want to basically go too overboard with like over plastering the car with all kinds of sponsors. Exactly. And that, and you just hit the nail on the head. You know, you get to a point where you can't cover a car in nothing but sponsors. It it would, first of all, it looks foolish. Second of all, you devalue everything you're doing. So the, the, the teams that, and I'm not saying these cars are not full of logos. Believe me, they are, you know, you see it, but imagine if now you were to add every single logo of every partner that each driver has, now you're like, first of all, on the car, I think is it, it, that's that's more of a bonus than anything, right? True. Sure. On the tr- on the track, you know, if I throw if I throw a, a Lando Quadrant thing on the car in a spot where you can barely see it anyway, you're never going to see it on the race. You're going to see it in pictures, press pictures afterwards. Okay, big deal. He can go and get more. He he could get more play just putting it on his own social, anyway. So it's kind of like one of those, what's the value of putting it on there? Also, we all know that there's weight involved too. I know that, that every little every little ounce, every little gram of weight matters. And so like I'm sure, sure. there's there's something, you know, there's I mean, even the paint weighs more, right? Like we see that teams are going with carbon, bare carbon because it, it it's less weight than if they had to paint it. So like I'm sure all of that comes into play too, if we really want to get technical, but I think purely from that perspective of not diluting what the brand is about is the easiest way to do it, to put it. Plus drivers come and go, man, you know, drivers, you're not necessarily, you may not be like Danny Rick might not be there next year. You know what I mean? So like now McLaren spent an entire year associating themselves with somebody for what benefit of their own? None. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's so many different facets to it as well, which makes it, I guess, a really interesting question. So shout out to whoever that was that created that question as well. It's given us a lot of food for thought here. And also in, in terms of, I guess, uh, another kind of interesting point you mentioned as well in terms of marketing. The next question, uh, Vincenzo, is sure. yeah. what's the coolest marketing strategy or PR kind of move you've seen by F1 oh. team? Because, oh, like, man. Uh, an example I was going to use is um, I sim race with like a Dutch teammate and he was going on about like life in the Netherlands. And he's saying that Verstappen obviously has this uh, sponsorship deal with uh, a supermarket called uh, Jumbo, or as they say, Jumbo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, what the kind of idea between that was that every time a customer would go into the grocery to get their shopping, they would earn points. And then after like a amount of time, once they've accrued these points, they could trade them in and then get like a replica um version of his like rb16 red bull and 
again, oh, like that's it's cool. pretty cool, like marketing play, you know, to get customers to go to the store to spend the money. But then wow, if they're okay. kind of max, then they can obviously use those points or money they've invested to get something in return as well. So yeah, do, are there any kind of like marketing strategies and stuff like that you've seen? That's you know, I, I think on the on the line of Red Bull, this this question, by the way, totally caught me off guard. I was not expecting this one. Um, <laughs> not that it matters. I'm just trying to now off the top of my head. But I think Red Bull in general, just their entire, their entire, they are a marketing company that happens to race, and they own a or and they are a energy drink. You know what I mean? Like everything sure. they do is fascinating. Um, Wow, cool marketing strategy. Um, there's nothing I, I right now, right off the top of my head, that I'm I'm like chomping at the bit about in in terms of what you just went. My head immediately went to content because I saw so you know as a content guy myself, as someone who produces content for for brands and myself, I always look at cool content strategies. I think McLaren did something really cool last year around the, the USGP where they. Uh, and they do a lot of this kind of stuff, which I think is cool. But they invited two American fans who knew nothing about the sport and they gave them like all access and they followed them around in the, this very vlog style video, which is awesome. Um, so you're seeing a lot more of that kind of thing. You're seeing the teams. I know Ferrari does it too, where they do like challenges with the drivers. McLaren does their unboxed. Like there's those types of things, which I think they're important because they're not uh, these – I'm going to use a baseball term. It's not hitting the home run. They don't hit – you know, it's not a big grand slam. It's a – it's singles, right? You're, 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 you're chewing it or, or you're, you're going one step at a time. It's little by little, right? So, like, every week I can expect great content from my team. And it, it's a way of keeping me engaged and coming back and feeling like I know these drivers. We're at a point where we – where we listen before 2017 people really didn't know the driver's personality the way you do now. Um, and, and I think that because of what we're blessed with being able to see on social media with Liberty media, being a media company, we're getting more and more of that. So to me, it's always very cool to see how teams are doing like how they're activating their marketing online to me that's the most like if there's one thing i would say is most fascinating like to me that's what's most fascinating to me um being in the u.s and not being around a lot of stuff like that like I, i i would assume in europe there's a lot more of those types of activations like here i mean Growing up, I don't, I can't remember any cool activation at like a gro, you know, a grocery store or a market. I, I don't remember any of that stuff with a Formula One team. You know what I mean? Like we just didn't have that. So that's why, right off the top of my head, I'm sure if I did a little bit of research, I could find some cool things. But, um, you know, now we've entered a whole new realm. Now that you know, we've got things like NFTs and cryptocurrencies and like all the opportunity that that presents. It's you know, presents for teams and drivers and 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 sponsors and partners um but i would say that me personally i like the content that team putting out in terms of uh you know keeping people hooked and keeping people kind of like wanting to know more about the team and the drivers To, to me those are that's really the coolest thing because of how different it is from years and years ago where we did not have any access like that. We didn't know, you didn't know anything about these drivers really outside of them driving, right. Or press pictures and whatnot. So uh, I I think, you know, as the sport continues to to grow, we'll see more and more uh, activations. I, that's a really good question. I, I, now I want to go look it up and I'm going to, I'm probably going to do, I'm probably going to do a whole article on it because this is actually really fascinating and I'm sure there is some cool stuff. Um, I know that, I know that like Richard Mill had just done something. Uh, they just actually made a watch based on Fernando Alonso's, uh, love of samurai culture. Okay. But like, I don't, wow. I don't know if I don't, but again, you're, you're talking about a very expensive watch. There's only 75 of those watches available. Like it's, it, that's not something like what you mentioned. So I, I don't know off the top of my head. I have, I'm going to have to go think about it. 
Sure, but again, Vinches, I wouldn't beat yourself up so hard on that one either, because it's just like, like you touched, like there's so many different facets and modes and different audiences. Even just as you were like speaking, I was thinking of another example where on the social kind of element, um, Mercedes have always said in the last recent years that they've wanted to uh, try and like introduce um, F1 to like, you know, kids from different backgrounds and it comes mm. to STEM subjects. Is, so like science, yeah. technology, English, maths, blah, blah, blah. And they had this cool feature where like they invited these school kids to go into the Mercedes uh, factory in Milton Keynes and Lewis dressed up as like an old oh, professor. Was, yeah. So one of the mechanics, I'm sure you've probably yep. seen that one. And mm-hmm. yeah, just how like even just through like those mediums or those kind of like very funny but like relatable exercises, how they can catch new fans and those kids they've, they've got a story to remember for the rest of their lives like that's better than any other f1 related story yeah. i could ever mention so yeah no that's i mean that's really cool and i think the more teams see those types of opportunities um the more we're gonna get stuff like that right uh they you were talking and i was thinking about like even just the way the the admins right have they talk true and uh, the, engage uh, the you know the admins of these of these social channels and they're engaging and they're talking and they are they are posting memes and like they are it feels like the brand knows us right and sure. i think that's 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 so cool right that is such a cool aspect of what this whole thing you know what liberty media is doing and it's becoming more real it's becoming more relatable um, and it's more fun, right? Uh, so yeah. Anyway, no, it's, it's so <laughs> true, and like it's so it's so like wide encompassing as well. And yeah, like you said, you mentioned, like we could probably spend an entire episode just kind of on that element yeah. of sport too. So it's it's so cool. But then in other hot news, um, Vincenzo, what have you made of just the situation with the Miami Grand Prix and like a looming lawsuit with the uh, the native residents in, in the area? And, you know, for those yeah. people that live under a rock or they haven't really kept up with the uh, the current affairs, could you explain like what's really going on stateside with this? So I, I think it's I think it's a absolute nothing. It, it, nothing's mm. going to happen from it. But for those that don't know, uh, Miami Gardens is a an area where the track, where the uh, hard rock stadium is, which is where the track is for formula one. Now hard rock stadium, for those that don't know is they host a, an American football team, the Miami dolphins. So there's events there eight times a year, massive events, plus concerts. There's massive, con- like there's massive events there. Mm-hmm. Miami gardens residents are trying to file a lawsuit against formula one saying that the the noise coming from the track from the cars will cause severe harm and damage to the residents uh whatever ir- irreparable damage whatever whatever mm-hmm. they're saying irreparable damage they are trying to file you know this lawsuit now mm-hmm. just just it's weeks before the race here and the judge has already said like i'm going to Basically, what's happening is the permit hasn't even been granted yet by the city, which a lot of people are like, well, how is there no permit yet? It's just the way permitting works. It doesn't it doesn't mean anything, really. It The city is going to grant the permit. It's that's pretty much a a, a non start. Let's it's going to happen. Right? Sure. Um, the judge is saying, well, they haven't even issued the permit yet. So I'm not even going to he- I don't want to hear this right this moment because there's really nothing here. Like we, they don't even have a permit yet. So. We don't know. Um, I think it's almost like a tongue in cheek type comment from the judge, but the whole story goes back to last July. Miami gardens is also a predominantly black area of, of the city. Okay. And there was um, a, a civil lawsuit that they were trying to uh, file against formula one saying that the race track or the 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 event itself will cause you know so much distress on a black area of the city that it's that's you know it's it, and i don't want to say racist because i that word gets thrown around too much but essentially like it's harming a single population sure and that was immediately that was dismissed that was it was like a non-starter they didn't even they were like no this is 
you guys are just looking for money basically, or you, you know, the, the, whoever the lawyer was there, you're, you're just looking for something. So that was kind of thrown out. Now they're coming back again and trying to put a different spin on it. Somebody's basically what's happening is goes back to what we were talking about earlier. The sport is getting really popular. There's a lot of money being thrown around. It's the crypto.com Miami GP. We know crypto.com is spending millions of dollars in, you know, investing in sports, um, including formula one. And so somebody's just trying to make a buck here. That's really what it comes down to. Somebody's trying to push and see what they can get out of formula one. You know, how serious are they? Are they, you know, are they willing to go to, are they willing to go to bat for this? I don't even think a judge will listen to this. It, a lot of people that are not in the U S you know, keep saying things like, wow, this is only, only America, only America. And yeah, unfortunately it, it's, it, if you see it more in America, in the U S because it's a very sue happy, you know, you can sue for anything, sure. you know, some, somebody looks at you wrong. I'm going to sue you. Uh, and I don't think that's only the United States because situations similar to this have happened in other tracks around the world. If this is not the first place uh, we're just hearing about it again, because it's a new brand new GP. It hasn't even gone out. You know, they haven't even, they haven't even done it. You know, it hasn't even been one race yet. And we're already having like these types of challenges, but it, it's really a non-starter. It's just more drama to, to stir the pot. And it's, you know, it's kind of funny because it's like, man, what will people, what kind of story will people tell themselves or, try to spin to make it make a dollar make some money right Absolutely. it's all about money yeah. it's all about money that's so true and I, whilst you were like giving a really excellent like um explanation as well vincenzo i was just thinking with a very hot take whilst you know there, there may be maybe a grain of like um not i wouldn't say sympathy but empathy with maybe the residents and you know mm-hmm. maybe because it's just something completely new for them in terms of the formula one they, they might have foot through the door Ultimately, exactly. though, like, this is one of those ones where I think by them protesting it so late, mm-hmm. what they're doing is just bringing more eyes, more attention, more yep. revenue to the, mm-hmm. to the actual sport itself. And yeah. if they're worried about, you know, these people making a, like, you know, a big buck and them not getting like a, a slice of it. They're already kind of making the situation a lot worse because it's the case now where if, if even if people weren't going to check out this Miami Grand Prix or watch it from home and stuff, no, they definitely mm-hmm. will because of all the, the publicity that's come out of it. And I guess that's where they're yeah, saying, you know, any publicity or bad publicity is good publicity in a, in a, in a regard as well. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. You just have <laughs> – the thing is it's, it's not a sport that people in – the U S are as familiar with too. So it's, it's like, Oh, this formula one thing is coming in here. And you know, the perception of the of formula one in general is that it's this elitist sport. It's not American football, which sure. rules rules sport here. It's, it's not, it's not baseball. It's not something like, it's not a, it's not a concert or a music festival. It, this is some random sport, a bunch of rich people driving around in cars. Like that's what the perception is. So if you don't know the sport, and you don't care about the sport, yeah, sure, why not? Let's let's try and try let's make some money, yeah. you know. Or then, somebody. Vincenzo, that's a quick God, question. I wanted to just throw in there as well. Like, for these people, like, what's the difference to them then between like Formula One and let's say like NASCAR right? or any other kind of motor discipline that that goes to America? Because I know with most NASCAR races, they they're on static kind of like circuits, like Daytona or Texas Speedway mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But I think there was, again, probably like a great shout to NASCAR too. I think they did like um, a race in the Coliseum or something like that. Yeah, yeah, in LA. At the beginning yep. of the year. And just, again, like, I'm imagining that there probably wasn't as many complaints or as much noise raised for that. So, yeah, it, it's, it's it's intriguing to see almost, like, how me, I, I don't know if it's, it, like, desperation, so I don't want to be it's, too ignorant and say that, but, yeah, no, I like... I think it's just, again, it, it comes down to perception. Formula yeah. One is perceived as having money. Maybe NASCAR doesn't, I don't want to say maybe, but NASCAR doesn't necessarily give off the same vibe as formula one right um when you think of formula one we, it goes right back to what we talked about ferrari monaco <laughs> champagne spraying right it's it's refined elite and so somebody said hey miami gardens residents you're i highly doubt the miami gardens residents were the ones that came up with this it was a lawyer that said i'm gonna i'm gonna rile up some 
people here. I'm going to tell them, or I'm going to say, hey, uh, we can make some money if we go after the um, go after Formula One. They've got a lot of money. Let's try and make some money. Like that's sure. usually what it is. It's always driven by a damn lawyer. Okay. Oh, it's fascinating to know because, yeah, you touched on it as well, Vincenzo. You mentioned that, you know, America kind of does have a suit culture. But, wow, I never knew it was that extensive as well in terms of just anything and everything. They will try and find, like, you know, a loophole or, like, try and find, like, a way to make a claim. So, well, like, again, there's a – there's a, there's a, I don't want to say famous, but it's, I know it's a popular story that I was told, grow, you know, growing up. And it's the truth, not a story. But, you know, there was somebody who went to McDonald's got a hot coffee, spilled it on themselves, and successfully sued McDonald's for burning themselves. What? what? Yeah. I mean, because the coffee was too hot. That's why you see caution hot contents on the side of a coffee cup at McDonald's or sure. anywhere, really. But, like, mm-hmm. th- th- that's – and, I'm, you know, again, I'm sure things like this have happened all across the world. I'm just – I'm going based on stories or things that I know from here. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, you know, w- w- when that's the case – when that's something that you already know you could win or do, why not? Why not do it for anything? You know, like let's, it costs them nothing. The lawyer is incurring the cost to, to give it a shot. And they're hoping it does not go to court because court is going to cost money. But if it doesn't go to court and Formula One just says, hey, here's some money, shut up, they win. You know, they, they win, now yeah. they, they win. So like, that's all they're hoping for. That's all a lot of this is based on oh it's fascinating and the more you live the more you learn so i'm sure Mm -hmm. the listeners are going to take a lot from that and me myself as well i'm just really intrigued because it's not the sort of thing you see every day but yeah and kind of a cool segue i wanted to kind of always have like a fantasy question i want to ask all of oh boy (laughs) written for it today but no i think you enjoy this one so i'm gonna set the scene Vincenzo, you, you've hit the lick. You've got like an amazing business that's done really well. You're in the billions. And, um, you know, like Stefano Domenicale, like a, a fellow Italian, comes to you and he says, Vincenzo, you know, um, I'd like you to help me organize your own Grand Prix. Oh, jeez. Uh, where would you hold it? Oh, God. <laughs> What exhibition <laughs> event would you run before it? So an example I'll give is uh, last year in Qatar, there was like um, like a little charity event where the drivers yep, yep. and ex-footballers like were playing fo- futsal with each other. And that was like the, the kind of like event. So what mm-hmm. exhibition event would you run? And which artist would you choose to sing the national <gasps> anthem? So three questions there. Where oh would you hold the race? What, what exhibition event would you have before the race? And which singer would you have perform the national anthem? Oh my god! Okay, this is jeez. You really. Um, we pull all the stops here. At jo- Georgina's stripping the dipping. We really are, do. Are you? Oh jeez! Does it have to be a track that's already existing? Or are you saying anywhere? Anywhere, literally anywhere. Oh my god! Jeez. Okay. Um, okay, I would. I. It would be in Italy. It would be in Rome for sure. I love Rome. I love the city. Uh, Andrea Bocelli would sing the Italian national anthem. I love Andrea Bocelli. And I would do a uh, driver, driver's and team principal football match at Stadio Olimpico where Roma plays, which I'm a Roma. I love Roma. I'm a, an Italian soccer. Um, that would be the a charity match it would be let's see drivers drivers team principals and uh drivers team principals and uh, lewis would probably want like kids or something involved so and some <laughs> somehow involve kids and make it like a underprivileged kids uh opportunity to, to play with them but it would be a, it would definitely do that at stadio olimpico that would be a whole spectacle but yes that's oh, I, I can literally envision it now that like Vincent, you might have a career in this, you know, like yeah. <laughs> organizing Grand Prix. Like, this might be your calling. Like, that would be sensational. I'm just trying to imagine it now. And you're, you're right. Just, you know, with yeah. the singer you mentioned as well, and it being in Rome, which has so much history. And, yeah. oh, just, um, and even just like having cool. a football match with the, the teams and the drivers and the team principals, it'd be incredible. And be out fun. of like all the teams and like team principals, who do you think would win the football match or come out on top? 
Oh, the drivers. I, the drivers are... I mean, and which Carlos, driver would you like put your money on? Because I've seen like Carlos, um, McLaren Carlos. science as well, like doing kickups like behind stage too. Yeah, I would I would put my money on, on Carlos. Um, Smooth operator. For, uh, he, I mean, he looks like he's got some skill. Uh, I would say Carlos and Charles are ve- seem very good. Um, I'm trying to think who else looks like they're pretty, pretty solid there. Uh, I, I know uh, Dan Ricardo seems athletic, so I think he would he would he'd do pretty well. I don't know if he's like, I don't know if he's a great. I, he doesn't seem like he's a big soccer guy or you know football <laughs> guy. He seems more of like a rugby or a American football guy. But sure, Al- Alonzo, I would say uh, Lewis seems athletic. He'd probably he'd probably be able to do pretty well. But yeah, definitely the drivers. The drivers would would absolutely dominate the team principals. I think it'd be such a cool concept. And again, may, maybe, George, you know, we have to actually write a letter to the FIA and, you know, like, oh. obviously giving credit to Vincenzo. Like, we'll, we'll give yeah. Vincenzo a higher cut of the commission here for the idea. But, jeez, that would that, be amazing, honestly. Like, you know, thoughts for the future. Hashtag thoughts for the future. So, well, yeah, we've, got the, you've got, we've got the E-Pri there, right, in Rome. Mm-hmm. So, I think it's, I think it's possible to, to do something. It would be fun to do it through the streets of, of Rome. I, I mean... I, this past summer, I was in Rome. I was in Italy when uh, Italy won the European Championship, and we went from Naples, where we watched, the, we we had watched the final. We went the next day to Rome because the uh, the, the the team came to celebrate through the city on on a uh, taking the trophy through the city on a pullman, and we were we were running through the streets of Rome because. There were so few tourists, but it was all Italians. There was th- tens of thousands of Italians through the streets, and we're running through the streets, following the the Pullman through the streets and the team, and cheering with the team, and singing the Italian national anthem, and singing, doing chants and stuff. And we're, and I'm like, man, this this city is so freaking beautiful. I was like, this, and that, so that's why it gave me the idea, just because that experience being able to run pretty much freely through the streets of Rome without worrying about getting hit by a car or anything like that was, <laughs> was a really cool experience. I said, this would be a fun city to do something in. Absolutely. And I, I just, it's such a great idea. And like, honestly, Vincenzo, you're giving me a really nice open goal segue to kind of the, one of the final <laughs> questions I was going to actually bring along is, um, we're actually going back home. We're going back to Italy. We're going to Imola next week. Yes. Um, what are your predictions for top three uh, finishing? Hole and third kind of caveat for in there random event or random thing that you think will happen in Imola. So, your top three uh, who will get pole, and then a random thing you think will happen in Imola next week. I, I'm not a so I'm not a gambler, I don't like to gamble, I don't like to bet, I don't like to, I never like to put my, my team uh, on a pedestal. But I, I, I think Charles. I think Charles drive was just so good last week and the car seems to be really, really good. If they bring the upgrade that's supposedly helping them with the porpoising, I think the car could be even more dominant. So I'm going to say we'll see Charles on pole again. And I think the podium we're going to end up with, uh, let's see. Lewis. Lewis, Lewis, Carlos, and 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 Charles on the podium, and I think, I think we're gonna see another Red Bull. Uh, for a random event, I think we're gonna see another Red Bull uh, reliability issue. I don't know which car, maybe both, but I just think we're gonna see another reliability issue. Oh, honestly, like it, it, it will be an interesting one. And it's cool as well that you've thrown Lewis in the mix there with, you know, the, the kind of podium shower, because there's been a lot of talk about Mercedes potentially bringing a new floor, maybe some other things as well, because they're trying to basically eradicate the, uh, the porpoising and balance uh-huh. the car and, too. I mean, nobody's talking about the fact that, and again, it's only three races, mm-hmm. but Mercedes is second in the constructors right now. Mm-hmm. George Russell is second in the constructors right now. Lewis is, he's, he's right there. He's fifth. So, you know, you want to talk about Verstappen. Oh, you know, great driver. This and that. Well, Lewis, again, this is all about slow. And this is, I'm firm believer in slow and steady Mm -hmm. and, and working 
it, over a course of a long season. Christian Horner has said, I would rather have a fast, unreliable car to, to fix than, an unre- uh, than a reliable, slow car, which I think shows the mindset of, I don't, I don't like that mindset because to me it's saying, sure, sure well, we'd rather just go up there and win a race every time we can or podium every time we've, but we may not finish half the races that we show up in. Well, what's that going to do for you? And you so when championships like that, of course. No. And if you look, so if just looking at the points, well, Max has won one race. He has 25 points. But that's the only race he finished. Mm. Lewis has 28 points. He's ahead of him in the standings. But everyone said, oh, his car's, his car's a dog. Oh, Lewis, can't, is, this, is, this is garbage. Well, no, but he's still got 28 points. How did he get 28 points? Because he just finished the damn race three times. True. Right? So that's why I, that's why I'm a I'm a I, I'm a believer that Lewis and that Mercedes will figure things out. I, I you know Lewis is a top top class driver. There's I, I he's someone I don't like to bet against his driving. Yeah, I style. wouldn't either. Yeah, his driving style. Max, I'm willing to bet against because with Max, you're I think you have a fifty percent chance of being right. He's either going to win or he's going to do something stupid. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's true. It's true. And that's the thing with Max and his temperament. And again, being a champion, regardless of the um, the very controversial circumstances that taken place last year, you know, winning the championship is one thing, but defending it is a completely new art. And he's having to find very out you know, the hard way, you know, exactly mm-hmm. that. You, very know, you have to different. actually, you know, try and get the team to work with you rather than like slamming them and slating the engine. You actually have to try and like mm-hmm. galvanize the entire team together. And even in the toughest moments, like, try and keep your head up and keep the morale up but at the moment mm-hmm. it seems like there's like a pointing match between him and Horner and who's really going to take responsibility for that and whilst they're doing that like you rightfully said Mercedes are just mining their own business they're just trying to make the, the minor amendments they can every single time and you're seeing that it's paying off for them because they're not for us mm-hmm. as you rightfully pointed out as well so great yeah. shout and, and definitely I agree with you on that uh, no, insight too you're, you're you know you're spot on with the uh... With, with the the fact that defending a title is not easy it's arguably more difficult than than chasing for one and i'm and that's not to take away from max at all because I, I believe max is a very good driver but it's it's arguably much harder to be able to have to defend the mental state you have to be in to defend a title to you know, Lewis has to deal for seven years. He, you're dealing with, um, is he really this good? Is it just the car? Uh, you know, new drivers that are constantly, you know, attacking on the track. You, you're, you're being chased. To, to have to defend and stay in, ahead is not easy. It's, it, you know, you don't have any advantages being out front. Um, let me scratch that. You have some advantages, but, you know, Things like you, you, you can't slipstream, for example, right? There, you don't have DRS half, most of the time <laughs> if you're leading out front. So True. It, it's, not, it's not easy. And so that's an easy way. I think, I think, folks, one of the things that people want to discredit Lewis on is, oh, well, it's easy to be in front. Well, it's not. It's not. And, and Max is now realizing that because the odds and the pressure are so much higher on him to win a race. Right. Oh, well, you're now expected to win. You're expected to finish in first. You're expected to be to be ahead of your teammate because you're a world champion now. And that kind of pressure causes you to dive bomb into a corner. Not that he didn't do that before, but it's going to cause you to do it even more. It's going to cause you to 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 make decisions on track that you otherwise may not. And every time I think he has a reliability issue, every time he has a, a battle like he lost in, in, in Bahrain with, with uh, Leclerc, every time those things happen, you are going to doubt yourself. That doubt creeps in. You, you can't tell me anybody's immune to that, but you're going to start to doubt yourself. You're going to start to doubt your equipment. And I also just genuinely don't think the Red Bull is set up for – max's driving style which is why we're seeing sergio have i think more success in the car currently but red bull just doesn't will never give him credit because he's not max sure um so anyway 
that's that's my spiel on that. No, but I think a lot of people are going to agree with you on that, Vincenzo, and me included in that too, because it's interesting to see how different drivers are perceived, and obviously when they go through their own challenges, how mm -hmm. some are able to rise above that, and you can really see the mental strength and resilience. Well, some other drivers, not naming names, you know, they'll cry on the radio or they'll start throwing the toys out of the car or they'll start throwing team members underneath the bus and you're, you're already kind of seeing the hairline fractures at Red Bull. So, and we, yeah. And the, yeah, and we, listen, that, that, that'll that happen anywhere. You know, I, I don't want to just bomb on, on Max by, by any stretch. I, I think the, the, the reality is that it's not easy to, to be in Formula One it's not easy to be the leader. It's not easy to be a chase. It, it's not easy to be in any of these positions. But these guys just talk so damn much sometimes that it's like, just shut up. You know, like Lewis did after after Abu Dhabi. He just he just stopped talking. He just went away for a few months. Like that was the best possible thing to do. You know, let sure. people just talk. Let people waste their energy on talking. And I'm gonna go do what I gotta do to get my head right. And that's it. And so, and I think that's, you know, that to me is greatness. That to me is, is where you level up and, and you can tell who, who is the challenger mindset, you know, in, in branding, there's, there's such thing as like the challenger mindset. Um, Netflix was a challenger brand at one point to blockbuster in the video rental space. And they never acted like the challenger brand. They acted like they were the leader right from day one. Blockbuster actually acted like they were the challenger. Blockbuster kept putting Netflix's name in everybody's mouth by, by all of their marketing became about Netflix and anti-Netflix. Well, you're giving Netflix free publicity. It's the same thing in Formula One with drivers. You know, Red Bull, you want to keep talking about Mercedes – that's occupying your mental space, your mental capacity. The more you're thinking about them, the less you're focusing on you, the less you're focusing on what you need to do. And that's what we're seeing. And I, th I think that's going to continue to play out at least for half the season until someone decides, hey, you know what? We need to start driving here. But that's, that's to be seen. Of course, you know, and it's it's interesting how like they some teams go to their racing, and of course, kind of some of the social political games are playing the paddock as well to try and unsell mm -hmm. the rivals. But you know, we we could probably do a separate episode on that too. So, <laughs> interesting. And um, the final question, Vincenzo. I'm listen. I'm just gonna put a disclaimer out there. This was Georgina's question. Please don't kill me because <laughs> no, it's fine. her question. But uh, she she was asking obviously with your Italian connections here. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? No. <laughs> you heard it no, from the man himself. I, I will say this. Pineapple on cheese bread is fine. But to call it a pizza is wrong. That's my opinion. <laughs> so if you, if, you want to put, if you want to put pineapple on something that you are calling pizza, it's just, it, you're just putting pineapple on cheesy bread. That's all. Yeah, so for, 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 that. for the people that enjoy it, fine. But but I I it's not pizza. I don't know. We're not it, calling pizza, it pizza out here. <laughs> we're not calling it pizza. Hey, well, Vincenzo, honestly, it, it's been really amazing to have you on this segment and this episode of the show. Like, you've been really insightful. And I think of all the episodes we've done so far, I've taken a lot of nuggets of information to carry away for me. And, you know, I was it was great to chop it up with you. Where can they find you, number one? Have you got any projects that you're looking forward to? Number two, and number three, just again, massive thank you, you know, for your time, and we're looking forward to bringing you again in the future. Well, thank you for having me. This was fun. This was a fun Saturday morning, um, especially you know, no race week, so it's it, it was nice. But um, yeah, I'm just, I mean, Twitter Twitter's the best place to find me. That's where I'm most active. Uh, at Vincenzo Landino is my handle, and. Um, projects i'm working on i mean right now i'm currently working i'm trying to collaborate with with a, a few folks on uh bringing helping brands into formula one um not necessarily the tier one brands but kind of like those second level brands that are looking to figure out how to work work uh into f1 and get involved in f1 so right right now i'm i'm, I'm working on building out a little bit more of an offering there and that's that's where i 
I would love to to be in that space more more than than anything else in the world. I would love to do that. So right right now it's it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a uh, discovery. I mean, I'm in a discovery mode with with that, and we're figuring out making some connections. Being on shows like this, I'm so grateful because you know it allows me to reach people that I don't I may not know, and and hopefully you know can uh, you know we can work together and kind of help each other out. And so I'm definitely definitely available to. Um, to talk more and, and like I said on Twitter is the best place to reach me. I'm very responsive on in my Twitter mentions. I'm very, very responsive. So DMs, whatever it might be. Oh, we love to see it, Vincenzo. And again, just like I can second that as well because you know, I think even just for normal people like me, I put Vincenzo like up there. Me, I'm some oh, normal guy on. just that's in my room, you know, sim racing and that. But you know, when you see like you know a personality like Vincenzo with a big blue tick, you know, and oh. he's renowned for his hard work and the stuff he does, you know, it, it can sometimes feel a bit daunting to reach out to them. But you know, if you've got really sensible propositions, if there's something awesome that you, you think that Vincenzo could help you out with then by all means, you know, make sure you approach him. And, um, of course, keep an eye on all the projects that he has coming up as well through, yeah. you know, his platform. So thank you, Vincenzo, for being on the show. Thank you. As thank always, you for having it's, me. it's a pleasure. we we got to get you back later on in the year. Maybe for maybe we'll have a Monza episode. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. That would be, that would be a good time. So we'll definitely set that up close to the time. <laughs> but as always, listeners around the world, I hope that you are having a great weekend. If you're celebrating Easter, happy Easter. If you're fasting for Ramadan, you know, have a great time and, and you know, use the time reflectively as well. And yeah, just to everybody, peace, love and prosperity. And until next time, we'll catch you soon on Georgina's Stripping the Dipping. Take it easy. <laughs>